Headlines once again this season presented by our friends at uh, Boston Pizza. You know who could use an ice cold shower? John Tortorella, head coach of the Philadelphia Flyers. So I'm sure you caught this. I mean, Torts is always must see TV, especially, you know, after his morning scrums or post games when things haven't gone well for the Philadelphia Flyers. And there have been a few of those this year. But recently, if, if, if the people listening haven't seen the clip, he was asked about Travis Konechny not being named to the All-Star. Instead, the selection for the Philadelphia Flyers is, is Kevin Hayes. We all know the Hayes story, right? Mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, for me, this is a nice touch. Kevin Hayes is probably thrilled to be going to the All-Star. Anyway, Tortorella just ripped the All-Stars. I don't care. It's nothing about this weekend. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Um, you know... <sighs> First of all, let, let me get your response to that. Does it matter to you? Does he need to be more respectful of the game, of the players involved, of the spectacle, recognition? This isn't for you, John. This isn't for you. This is for the fans, and it's for the league. So I'm going to stop there, let you answer, and then I, I've got a follow-up that is league-related. I think every coach could care less about the All-Star game and who's going. Um, to them, it's more of a pain in the rear end than anything else um there's a different there's always a different way to answer a question i mean like he could say i don't really care but it's good for the players and the fans seem to like it and the corporate sponsors seem to like it like that that would be the easier way not not the john torts way of answering the question but it would be the easy way to answer the question but the the coaches and the managers they they don't care they're like what is it what does it matter to them it's a couple of days off and you hate it if your team's going well cuz you don't want to lose any momentum and you know you you just you just don't it's a non factor really to to most people um like that are, that aren't going if you're not going you just look at it as a day off a couple of days off yeah exactly yeah well look i mean the the nhl wasn't happy with this comment and in fairness to to torts it was at the end of his availability. He, he he answered, you know, he brushed it off, and then he walked away. Um, so the NHL reaches out to Torts. John, come on. Like, this is a major event. You right. know, it's for the fans. It's for the sponsors. It's for the players. He apologized. So, you know, it, it feels like it should be end of story there. But I tell me what you think about Philadelphia, Ray. I'm looking at the Philadelphia Flyers, and I just don't see it. I, I see that they've got... Some good players. Carter Hart has had a decent year in net. Um, the hiring of John Tortorella for that team, and I'm sure we've talked about it on the pod before, is curious to me because it's like ownership in, in Philadelphia said, well, you can talk Chuck Fletcher about a rebuild or a renovation. We're not investing in that. So you go out there, do your best. John Tortorella is available. Let's hire him to coach this team, and maybe he can put us right back on track. And it just doesn't seem to be working. They, they look. They've had flexes where things have gone better, but that's not that doesn't seem to change what appears to be inevitable, does it? Like this team needs a ton of work. I can't. I can't for the life of me figure out that roster. I, I, I when you say whether John is the right coach or the wrong coach for a rebuild, you could have anyone you want standing back there. And that team is a mishmash yeah. of players of various ages and contract lengths. And like, I don't, I don't see any way that a complete restructuring has to happen. Here's the problem. And mm-hmm. I don't know if we're getting into it later on or not, but the, when people talk about a rebuild, you can't just ignore the six or five or six years of terrible hockey that is going to happen as you rip your roster apart. Yeah. Here's the second part of it. To rebuild, you need to move contracts because you have to get players that are inexperienced or that that are going to play to a level that gets you into the top end of the draft. Like that, that's what you need. That's what a teardown is. They just signed Travis Sanheim yeah. for eight years. They've got wrist aligning for I don't know how long. Where are you possibly trading yeah. those contracts? You can't. Kevin Hayes, mm-hmm. I think, has got four years left. 
they're you know, even a piece they're not off, you know like right they're not fast it's hard to move they're these not guys yeah so drakes they're not fast they're not big they're not tough they're not like you've got to be something you've got to have something to hang your hat on and say this is what we're building now mm-hmm. i it's curious that they went and hired john only in that I don't know how much road Chuck Fletcher has there or the general manager, or are they going to say, you know what, we need to change that as well. Yeah. But if they change that, then you've got a coach there that wasn't hired by whoever the new GM is like the yeah. whole sequence of things seems jumbled up there. And, and it's a tough spot to be. Yeah. It really is. I, I keep, I keep hearing Danny Breer, you know, uh, just ascending to the title of general manager, whether that's, Okay, okay, so here's here's my thought year, about you know Drake's here's my thought about that. So say it is Daniel Briere. He's never been a manager before, and you're gonna dump mm-hmm. this mess in his lap? Like he'd need help. Yeah. Oh f- like how how do you where would you even start? It's like I look at Mike Greer, yeah. who has impeccable credentials, uh impeccable resume of people talking about what he is like look at the mess he has for his first job in san jose like how do you get from a to b there yeah like how do you do it yeah and an experienced guy is going to have a hell of a patient ownership oh boy yep all right uh your former team the la kings have uh turned it up a notch no question about that uh, I look at that division, and I'm sure you see it the same way. That's a fun grouping, especially in the top three to watch, right? Uh, so LA has closed the gap on Vegas. Seattle is is just not going away. We, we, you know, media, not we, but media in general, have got to stop waiting and expecting the Seattle Kraken to come back down to earth. Now, a lot can happen in the second half, so let's just see how it plays out. But um, LA scores four power play goals versus the Oilers on Monday night. We're recording Tuesday. So what they go four for seven <laughs> against the Edmonton Oilers. So it, it tells you that the power play for the Kings, at least in this game was snapping and the penalty kill. Oops. Just about knocked everything over. The penalty kill for, for the Oilers was, was not in tune. Uh, so where do you want to start with that? You want to start with the Oilers and how they seem to be fumbling kind of, they, they win a game, they lose a couple, they win a couple, they lose three, like it's all over the map here, it seems, in Edmonton. Yeah, now I did I did their game right before the new year. They just blew Seattle out of the water. It wasn't even close. McDavid put on a show. It was, yeah, yeah. he had five points. and Five-pointer, yeah. And I, and I thought, Dregs, that Seattle looked a little tired. They looked, like, they looked worn out. And then on New Year's Day, Seattle totally dominated the Islanders, and that was the start of their five-game winning streak that they're on now. So I look at the Oilers. They look like they're going to be better, and then they're not. They're going to get a Vander Kane back here, I think, in the next 10 days, which is going to be a big help, right. Yeah, really big help for them. They have, they have a quartet of forwards that give them virtually nothing. Yamamoto scored a couple of times in the last 10 days. They need him to – to contribute something. Fogel hasn't had much for them. Um, now you can say, well, you know, whatever, Warren Fogel or Kyler Yamamoto, these are guys that are in the depth part of their lineup and they need these guys to mm-hmm. score. They, it can't yeah. just be the two guys, it, you know, it can't just be McDavid and dry yeah. Yes. Yesterday without, again, without Kane in the lineup, McDavid started with Costin. Clem Costin and Kyler Yamamoto was his wings. Like that's yeah. a problem. Um, Stu mm-hmm. Skinner got, you know, started yesterday. Campbell came in in relief. Like it's they're You're right. They're scrambling around a little bit. They're hanging around that second wild card spot so that I, they don't have a lot of cap room. And so like everybody else, a change is going to be difficult for them, but I, I think they can and should be one of the eight playoff teams. Uh, LA. Okay. Here's something. I'm going to tie LA and Seattle together. Teams talk about their goaltending ad nauseum all the time. So you tell me who bet (laughs) 
on Phoenix Copley and Marty Jones as being the backstops for no LA chance. and Seattle. Zero. Phoenix no, Copley, no. they called them him up because Cal Peterson somehow lost it his way. He couldn't stop a beach ball. So they're like, you go to the yeah. American League, see if you can figure it out. They got five million bucks a year tied up in Peterson. Just you go figure yeah. it out. We'll call up Phoenix Copley. He can back up Jonathan Quick. Copley's eleven and two. Quick can't get back in the net. Eleven and two. Mm. Marty Jones was bought out in Philadelphia or was bought out in San Jose, signed in San Philly Jose. for one year. Seattle signs him. He's 19, five and three. He's got 19 wins. <laughs> like, so who figures, who figures out the goalie position? Oh yeah. I'm doing Florida tonight in Colorado. They got 14 million bucks tied up in their goalies. 14 million. Phoenix Copley's making 720. Problem there. Oh, it's Phoenix Copley's making 725 grand. And uh, Marty Jones, I think, is making 1.1. 1. 1. Like, you figure out the goalies. The backup in Seattle, they're paying them $6 million. Philip Grubauer. Like, that wasn't the plan. Yeah. No. It's crazy. No, no. Things are starting to percolate a little bit, Ray, on the trade front. Um, that doesn't mean that there are any trades imminent. It's just we're in the new year here. Um, and and teams are starting, when you get to that midpoint of the regular season, realize that, okay, we've got to make some decisions here. You know, do we try and add, bolster our lineup and, and make that playoff push? Or do we just realize that we're, we're not a playoff-worthy team? So let's keep our powder dry. Anyway, lots of conversations going on. Um, I know teams are poking around Matt Dumba with the Minnesota Wild, and that's not unusual. His name always seems to be swirling around this time of year and in trade speculation. Um, teams include the Ottawa Senators. Ottawa's like Edmonton. Pierre Dorian and Kenny Holland have been looking for a defenseman for ages, right? Mm -hmm. But Ottawa's in a precarious spot in that they're seven points out of a wild card spot as we tape this. So, you know, if, if you're acquiring Matt Dumba, even though he's a pending unrestricted free agent, um, you know, do you trade and try and sign him? Yeah, that makes some sense because you're giving up like a key asset, like a Ridley Gregg, something like that, I would yep. think. I would think. But then if you're Minnesota, you need a defenseman back. You know, I mean, Minnesota's a pretty good team this year. They look pretty good. You take a piece like Matt Dumba out of the lineup and that creates a significant hole. So... Where do you sit in, in terms of, of trying to find a fit like that? Um, because we do focus on the pending unrestricted free agents. And, you mm -hmm. know, I think a lot of GMs, right, learned something from the, from the Calgary exercise last year. You know, Calgary does a jam dance with Johnny Goudreau. Johnny Goudreau leaves. Um, we know the rest of it. Matthew Kachuk doesn't want to stay long term. They move him to Florida and they try and, and plug the holes. Brad Trilliving did good work, but he was forced into doing that work, right? So mm -hmm. does many take that approach and not let a Dumba go to free agency or do you just wait and see where you're at end of February, close to March 3rd, the deadline? Well, I, I think, I think Minnesota waits as long as they can to try and determine exactly a, where they are and b what, what they can um, acquire in, in a, in a trade. Mm. Um, here's the thing. Minnesota's defense is not big and they're not, Outside of, of Middleton, um, you know, they're not they're not a stout defense. You know, Jonas Brodeen's a hell of a right. player, yeah. but he's not not a physical guy. Kalen Addison's had a nice rookie year, and Jared Spurgeon are not big guys. Dumba does, even mm -hmm. though he's not a big guy, he plays he plays with significant bite. And so to take him yeah. off that defense, I I think is a loss. Is it, it a it's a loss because you if you don't replace him with another D clearly that's a loss, but if you don't replace that bite Drake's, I think that's that, that would be something Minnesota would, would miss. Now they've had to do this juggling act since the buyouts of Suter and Parisi. And they knew that the, the significant part of that is coming up like that. that those cap numbers are going to get ugly for them over a three year yeah. period. So, Here's the thing as well with Dumba. He's not coming back anyway. He's not coming back to Minnesota because there is no room to sign him back there. No. So if you know you're losing him anyway, 
there's, there's clearly two ways to look at it. Anything you get is a bonus or yeah. we're going to lose them anyway. Let's, let's take as much as we can from the benefit he gives our team and just let them go. But that, that's going to mm-hmm. be, if I'm Billy Guerin, there's not a lot of D out there that teams are offering up. I'm, I'm just waiting and I'm waiting as much as I can. Now there's some GMs like to yeah. strike early as quick as they can in January and just get it done. And I don't mind that either, yeah. but this yeah. doesn't feel like that to me. No, I'm with you. Uh, although when I look at Ottawa, as I said earlier, you know, Dorian's been looking for an ad on defense for months, you know, certainly prior to the start of this season. And if this team is going to make that playoff push, and it's, it's a tough spot. I mean, they're in a sale process. I mean, there's a lot going on in mm-hmm. Ottawa. So can I, can I offer my, he's a can bit I, more careful. Yeah, let me of offer my two, yeah. let me offer my two cents of never being a GM before. Don't tell anybody okay. and certainly don't tell the public what you're looking for. Because if you don't get it, mm-hmm. it looks like a failure. Everybody can look at yeah. the Ottawa defense and say they need to add a defenseman. Don't say anything. Clearly, he's mm-hmm. trying to get a defenseman. Clearly, it's not very easy. Like, we understand that. But don't tell anybody. Say nothing. There's, mm-hmm. no, there's no point nor benefit in it, in, in my opinion. Well, it's no fun for guys like me, Ray. Come on. Oh, I make you, you work harder. Talk. I'd make you work yes, harder. Yes, yeah. All right, let's wrap up headlines with with some focus on junior hockey. Um, first of all, why don't we start with Connor Bedard? I mean, uh, uh, what did he do? Well, he helped Canada win gold in spectacular fashion, yeah. I might add, bearing points of the World Junior Championship. Gets back to Regina and just has a boatload in his first game back <laughs> with the Regina Pats. Um, so... I'm wondering, I, I don't think anyone is ever touching the Ray Ferraro season of what was 83-84, 108 yeah. goals in 72 games. I mean, do you know who second place is on the list? Goals uh, scored yeah, in Bill, the Western Hockey League? Bill Lego, right? Is it? How many did he score? I thought it was Kyle Reeves. Oh, I, I thought like Lego had 90. No, it's Lego because I passed oh. Lego. Okay. Billy D had... Yeah. Billy D had 96 goals. There you go. Okay. Well, I was, I looked at the wrong page because I saw Kyle Reeves of the Tri City Americans and I'm like, ah, and he's had 89 in 90 and 91. <laughs> anyway, point being, um, tell the story because I know, I know someone approached you, um, you know, online to say, you know, if, what was the question? If Bedard played as a 19 year old, which he will not in yeah. the Western Hockey League, could he beat your? record well if he played a full season i i'd say if so he right now he's got i think he's got 29 goals in 31 games um last Mm -hmm. year he scored near a goal a game it and i think he would have come up with probably in the 65 to 70 range last year so in two years could he could he find another 20 goals or 25 goals probably i would say so Here's the problem. If Connor Bedard played as a 19-year-old, certainly he'd be on the world junior team. So that would cost him 15 games, 10 to 15 games. I never got picked for the team. I only had 50 goals at Christmas. That wasn't enough for them. So I stayed (laughs) stayed the whole year. So I played all 72 games. I averaged a goal and a half a game, like a goal and a half a game. I think of it now, it's absurd. It really is absurd, but <laughs> I, I look if if he played fifty five, if he played seventy two games, I think he could. I think he could give it a run. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. It's yeah. the times were different. The goalies were different. We all know that. But yeah, he's a he's a just a different sort, man. Like he's a different player, and I I think he sure. I think yeah. it would be really sure. cool. It was a great question on Twitter, and I. I thought it would be a fun it. thing yeah. to talk about. And man, I I'll tell you, it would be, it would be really fun to watch him. Cause he would, he would give it a chase, a, like a real, real chase. hundred percent. I mean, he's better on a goal per game clip now, as you mentioned. Oh, it's, it's crazy to, to watch him play. It's not, but just think a goal, a game clip. Okay. So, that gets you seven drinks, a goal, yeah. a game clip. 72. That gets you 70. Yeah. Okay, great. You need another 36. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, like I said earlier, I don't think it's going to be touched even by a great player like Bedard. Um, some wild CHL trades, and I'm not sure we're surprised by this because it happens basically every year. But maybe it's the quality of the players getting moved that generates the the mammoth packages sure. in return. Um, but talking about the Regina Pats, you remember Brent Parker, of course, right? Yes. General manager for the yep. Pats, president. He tweeted last night, quote, if back in the day someone had made me an offer for Jordan Eberle, uh, so at J-E, so J Eberle underscore seven for half of what is being paid in today's WHL deals, I would have traded him twice. My Lord, what a different landscape from 10 years ago. And he tags at the WHL. So just to give you an indication of what he's talking about. So Zellweger and Hofer uh, are traded from Everett to the Kamloops Blazers for four players and 10 WHL draft picks. And then we had Shane Wright in the Ontario League traded from the Kingston Frontenacs to the Windsor Spitfires for two players and seven OHL draft picks. Now the picks are easy to move because you have no idea what this kid is going to look like. I mean, you're, you're trading peewee players in essence, right? Mm -hmm. No Mm -hmm. minor bantam players, but it's, it's just like, I'd like to be a fly on the wall for those discussions because when you're talking about Shane Wright or Zellweger, you know, two world junior champs, Mm -hmm. they're going into that discussion saying, well, here's where I want to go. I'll give you a list of two, maybe three teams, not 10 teams. I want to go to this team or that team, but these deals are just bizarre in terms of how significant they are in numbers. I I just, I can't <laughs> even get my head around how you would quantify what these picks are worth. Like, I, I know, like in the NHL, there's a, teams have an analytics board that basically says the 53rd pick is worth in a trade mm-hmm the 73rd pick and the 88th pick like there's a there's a formula through analytics that help determine what picks fit where how are you determining what the 2026 first round draft pick is worth like it's just a thing so if if you look at it this way they draft 14 year olds right teams draft 14 year old players into major junior hockey The 2026 pick is four years away. That's Mm -hmm. a 12 or 11 year old right now. Mm -hmm. Like, can you imagine going, oh, I I can see where we're going to be in our rebuild plan in 2026. Like, don't forget, it's not the NHL where you acquire players and they stay for six or eight or 10 years. It's an age out league. Yeah. Four years, out you go. Here come the next guys. These, oh, when I read yeah. it yesterday, I'm like, 10 picks. If I'm the GM, oh, yeah, I'll give you another pick. Sure, why not? Like, what does <laughs> what it even does it mean? matter at that point? What does it mean? Uh, <laughs> anyway, Crazy. obviously, now we, 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 we pay attention to you know, what Shane Wright's going to do in Windsor. And sure. What, uh, Zellweger and some of the other pieces are going to do in, in Kamloops. So there you go. Those are your headlines. Once again, we thank our good pals at Boston Pizza. 